Whoa. Good morning. Quite exciting here. It's, uh, this is really picking up. <laughs> All right. Well, nice turnout today. Really. Okay, today we will, uh, we have a lot of, we have a busy, busy schedule. Mark has given me a task of about 100 slides. Yeah, but, but at least, at least 20, at least 20 of them have to do with the Krebs cycle and uh, normal bio, biologic things. So. You are welcome. <laughs> No, today we're talking about gastro, gastro, gastrology and urology. Uh, it's going to be disappointing uh, uh, for, for Dr. Bell because I'm not going to talk about aging problems with urology uh, because it's w way too close to my own heart. So first with gastrology. Um, and urology, actually both, both things have general risk factors that, uh, 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 that are societal in nature, uh, mostly excessive alcohol consumption, excessive smoking, increased stress, uh, sometimes ingestion of caustic substances and poor bowel habits. Uh, acute emergencies usually arise from chronic underlying problems. Spoiler alert. Now, abdominal pain comes in a couple flavors, uh, visceral and somatic. Visceral pain is vague, poorly localized, comes from the viscera, from the organs. Somatic pain is more sharp and localized. Uh, this thing sh sort of shows some of the places that somatic pain and visceral pain show up, uh, especially as referred pain because uh, uh, as we all know, shoulder blade, right shoulder blade, right uh, 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 shoulder pain can be referred pain from the liver or gallbladder. Uh, likewise, on the left hand side, shoulder pain, shoulder blade pain may be uh, referred from the spleen. Uh, <clears throat> Often cholecystitis, uh, gallbladder pain, and such is localized in the right upper quadrant classically. Um, uh, appendicitis in the right lower quadrant. Causes of the pain are either acute infl inflammation, either inflammatory um, things in, uh, uh, caused by bacterial or viral infection or uh, inflammation from um, chronic inflammatory things, such as Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis. Then pain comes from distension. Uh, the, uh, the bowel itself, you can crunch it and it doesn't really have much sensation, but stretching causes extreme pain. Uh, hollow organs, when they stretch, are painful. Solid organs, when they stretch, such as with hepatitis, the, when the liver stretches, it hurts, it aches due to the stretching of the uh, membrane that surrounds the liver, the capsule. Uh, ischemia, and uh, older persons, person, diabetics, people with severe uh, atherosclerotic disease can get severe ischemic bowel pain because the bowel can have angina, just like your heart can have angina because you get uh, spasm of or ac actual uh, uh, obstruction of an artery causing acute ischemic bowel pain. Well, you know, when you're, when you're assessing a uh, potential uh, gastro, gastrology or urology problem, same, same basic thing you all know, scene size up, initial assessment, scene clues, uh, walk in, there's blood on the floor, it's 
got to be coming from someplace. If you're in the, to if you're in the bathroom, good bets. Uh, identify and treat life-threatening conditions. There aren't a lot of them, but we're going to talk about them. Focused history, sample history, OPQRST, the usual, the usual EMT approach. Associated symptoms, pertinent negatives are important in your documentation. Now, physical examination, your general assessment, vital signs, treat the emergency. Abdominal assessment, inspect. Uh, Cullen's and Gray Turner signs are signs of blood in the abdomen or, infect, or uh, um, uh, inflammation. They're just, they're bruising essentially. Inspect, auscultate, everybody normally has bowel tones, bowel sounds. Your bowel is, in t is moving all the time. A silent abdomen is usually a bad sign. That means that the bowel doesn't want to move because it increases pain. It increases discomfort. Palpate, if palpate all quadrants of the abdomen. Indicate pain, indicate if there's rebound. Now, when you palpate, palpate gently and then with deeper pressure. Each quadrant. Don't check for rebound the first time. Rebound is you push down and say, does it hurt? Does it hurt? And then you take your hand off really fast. If it hurts worse, they don't, and they won't like it, uh, that's because you have inflammation of the peritoneum. So whatever is infected or inflamed or causing a problem underneath that, palpa the, underneath that palpating hand is the peritoneum is inflamed. Okay, specific illnesses, we're going to look at, talk about upper GI, lower GI, liver, and then the accessory uh, GI things, the liver, gallbladder, pancreas, appendix. Upper GI bleeding. We're going to go for the big exciting ones first. Uh, upper GI bleeding generally occurs either from peptic ulcer disease, probably number one, gastritis, from a varix, or a rupture of, a, of, a, of esophageal veins, varices. Uh, a Mallory Weiss tear is a tear at essentially at, through the mucosa of the, at the junction of the esophagus and stomach. And so when it tears through, the, when, and it, it can occur from extreme vomiting, uh, other things. Usually is associated with underlying gastritis, peptic ulcer disease, or uh, reflux. So violent vomiting will, will tear through the, uh, through the uh, mucosa and then bleed. Esophagitis, inflammation of the esophagus, duodenitis, inflammation of the duodenum. Duodenum is the, is the portion of the intestine right after the stomach. Now, signs and symptoms with upper GI bleeding, generally general abdominal discomfort, not particularly localized. You palpate the abdomen, it's generally tender, not necessarily more tender over the stomach itself. But characteristic upper GI bleeding is hematemesis, bloody vomiting, and melana. Melana is black, tarry stool, dark stool. And the reason it's dark is because the blood has gone through the stomach and duodenum. So it's been partially digested by stomach acid. And the stomach acid has also turned the, the iron in your 
hemoglobin from ferric to ferrous so that it becomes browny black in color. Obvious, obviously, with severe upper GI bleeding, you're going to get your classic signs and symptoms of shock. Low MAP, low blood pressure, rapid pulse, change in LOC. Important, you know, the important things that you treat that. Now, your general treatment, follow your general universal treatment procedures, but Obviously, if they're in shock, you treat shock. You begin replacement with two large bore IVs. And what is a fluid challenge? A fluid challenge is 20, 20, 20 cc's per kilo. Adult, child, anybody. Now, you, we usually think fluid challenge for someone in shock, cardiac-wise, we give them maybe 250 to 500 cc's at a time, but because that's we're worried that, that they might have congestive failure. You're not gonna really worry about somebody who's in shock from a GI bleed about congestive failure, are you? The ultimate end of, a, I mean, a fluid challenge is really 20 cc's per kilo, then repeated. Now, esophageal varices. The problem with esophageal varices is, is you get portal hypertension, and it's generally caused in this society from chronic alcohol abuse and liver cirrhosis. Now, it can occur as a result of the hepatitis as well, with chronic liver disease. But in our society, alcohol is your big, your big number. Now, occasionally, uh, caustic substances are involved in this. Usually they have varices to start with and then caustic substances erode through the varix. What happens with, with, with portal hypertension, portal vein is the vein that drains the intestine. And it drains, it brings all your stuff that's been absorbed from the intestine to the liver for processing. So when you get liver cirrhosis that basically causes the pressure in the portal vein to rise, i.e. portal hypertension. It doesn't go, you know, the normal pressure would be probably zero to five millimeters, and it rises to 40. Now, the one end of the portal vein is your hemorrhoidal veins, tail vein. One end, the other end of the portal system is in the esophagus. And what happens in the esophagus is you get hemorrhoids in the esophagus. You get big, venous, bulgy things which push up and ultimately thin out the mucosa of the esophagus, and then it may erode because you get stomach acid, other caustic substances coming up from the refluxing from the, intest uh, from the uh, stomach. You get um, uh, alcohol and uh, other somewhat caustic things going down from the top end. These erode, and when they erode, they're big veins and they bleed excessively. And there's no pressure hardly in the, you know, most venous bleeding stops because if you bleed, if you, a vein breaks and bleeds into uh, a solid organ or even into your, your muscle, it gets to be, the hematoma gets to be a certain size and has enough pressure to occlude the vein and stop. But there's no pressure in the esophagus, so it just keeps bleeding. Then the other thing associated with chronic alcohol abuse and liver cirrhosis is you also are missing all your vitamin K, so your coagulation sequence is interrupted by missing that necessary element. And so they bleed, you know, if you don't have vitamin K, it's like being on Coumadin, same difference. So 
they have hematemesis, copious amounts of hematemesis. I remember the first patient I ever saw in an in internship who had esophageal, you know, said, I don't feel good, and then he presented all over the front of my white uh, scrub outfit uh, about two liters of bloody, partially digested stomach contest. <laughs> um, and then he became quite shocky. So, hematemesis, sometimes dysphagia, difficulty swallowing the esophagus, you know, um, uh, doesn't like to have more things presented to it. But it's painless bleeding. Esophagus doesn't have that much sensation and the veins don't have any nerves in them. Then you get gross hemodynamic instability, classic signs of shock. Uh, you have to do aggressive airway management of these people, aggressive fluid and resuscitation. Uh, and your orders are specific. There are some patients who get transported only to Southwest Washington Medical Center in this county. And you know them, acute MI and systemic cardiac arrest with the return of spontaneous circulation, trauma activations, and severe GI bleed with patient in shock with suspected esophageal varices with or without a history of alcoholism and or liver failure. And the reason we want them only to go to South, this is at the request of the gastroenterologist because the only thing, only way we can usually stop these people from bleeding is to have an interventional radiologist go in and occlude those veins and arteries going to the veins. Doesn't hurt, that doesn't hurt the esophagus. There's enough, there's enough collaterals that they get along just fine. But that's what cures them. There used to be all sorts of treatments which were, were, were usually unsuccessful and grossly difficult on both the physicians and the and the patient required massive transfusions generally um, and replacement of, of clotting factor. Acute gastroenteritis. Um, the mucosal GI surfaces are damaged. Generally, uh, it's a pathological inflammation used uh, which, with hemorrhage and erosion of mucosa, and it's usually caused by alcohol and tobacco use, chemical ingestions, things like uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, uh, because uh, they're not only somewhat acidic and caustic themselves, but they will, they, they're, they're anti-prostaglandins, so they, pr they suppress one of the protective hormones that's produced by your stomach to protect itself. So it's a double whammy. It's both irritating and it suppresses the anti-irritating factor. Um, systemic infections, obviously a lot of gastroenteritis is caused by systemic things. Uh, Mark's example here is histoplasma, which is pretty unusual in this area, but uh, it's a, it's an, it's a, uh, basically a uh, fungal type of infection which can cause ga acute gastroenteritis. Signs and symptoms, acute gastroenteritis. We've all had it, probably. Rapid onset of severe vomiting and diarrhea, sometimes with bloody vomiting. You have to vomit a bit. You, uh, severe gastroenteritis is almost always associated with blood in the stool or hematemesis itself. Diffuse abdominal pain, generalized, not, it's not localized to anything, it's just a general, because the entire um, um, GI system is essentially involved in the inflammation. Nothing magic about treatment again. Approach the patient with 
you know, looking for critical, critical findings, life-threatening signs, fluid and volume replacement, antiemetics will work. Now, we don't give them anti-diarrheal medicines as a rule because, you know, this is nature's way of telling you to get something out of your system usually. Uh, so keep ahead of fluids. We don't worry about the rest. Chronic gastroenteritis, um, similar, similar findings, only not as acute uh, uh, due to long-term mucosal damage, uh, which is primarily microbial, bacterial in origin, uh, most common in developing countries, uh, most commonly associated with inappropriate or uh, uh, unclean water. Peptic ulcer disease. The erosions are ultimately caused by a gastric acid, uh, which is obviously normally produced by the stomach, but um, it's associated with a number of other factors, uh, including use of nonsteroidal anti-inflammatories, and for the same reason, they suppress the normal prostaglandin that helps protect the stomach. Um, alcohol and tobacco use, uh, and then H. pylori, which is a bacteria. So we found a, a, that, that at least the current theory is that about 50% of peptic ulcer disease is associated with, you find evidence of this bacteria. Uh, you can actually culture the bacteria or just use a uh, more commonly, they use a test uh, to um, uh, evaluate for the antibodies to it. And then the current thought is to treat it with antibiotics for X amount of time. The terminology where you have your peptic disease, it, it depends on where, where the, who, what's involved. So. Uh, a gastric ulcer is obviously in the stomach, and the most common place is along this outer curve of the stomach. Uh, then the a duodenal ulcer is in the duodenum, so it's any place where there's high levels of of gastric acid there, and the duodenum has a uh, has a lot of it. Signs and symptoms of acute peptic ulcer is abdominal pain often not terribly localized, but if it's in the stomach, you may have, you, you may, if, if it irritates the peritoneum at that level, you may get some pain there. Um, pain is described as everything from burning in nature to deep, achy pain. Um, if, if the gastric ulcer ruptures, it can rupture internally when you get acute pain associated with bleeding, hematemesis. And if it bleeds to the stomach, then you'll get melana ultimately. It can rupture as well, and it can rupture into the peritoneum, and then you get acute pain, acute shock usually, uh, and acute peritoneal signs at that level. Treatment. Pain medications, as, as indicated, if we, if we still have any over the next uh, couple of months, uh, the hospitals are running out of pain medicine. We've still got some. Um, now, lower GI bleeding. This is more closer to my heart here, too. Uh, bleeding distal to the ligament of trites. Ligament of trites is a ligament that helps to hold down the, uh, the distal end of the duodenum and the first part of the ileum to the, to the peritoneum. So it's, it's, the, it's, by def, it's the surgical definition of the upper GI versus lower GI. Most common cause is of uh, lower GI bleeding is diverticulosis. You can also have colon lesions. Uh, sometimes uh, 
um, colon cancers present with uh, the first sign is some rectal bleeding. Uh, and more commonly, rectal lesions, and the most common of those are hemorrhoids. Um, inflammatory bowel disorder can cause bleeding and also a lot of diarrhea and mucus in the stool, ulcerative colitis, and Crohn's disease. With lower GI bleeding, obviously it's important to determine what's acute versus chronic. Well, most of the time people aren't going to call you for chronic. Chronic lower GI bleeding, they don't even notice usually. That's the kind of thing that you, that, you know, you get the stool guaiac test to see if you've got occult blood, if you've got, you know, blood that you can't see in the stool. <coughs> Most people get real excited if they, if they actually have blood, blood, blood in the stool. Um, a number of people come in that I've seen very anxious, you know, they squeal about it, and, and, but they're, they don't have any blood in the stool. They have, they've been eating a lot of beets, and so they get red, red stool. Beet juice is really good for that, too. But, you know, we do check them out for that. So, acute versus chronic. And then the quantity and color of the blood in the stool. Normally, bright red, like venous or even arterial blood, comes from the distal end of the colon, the rectum and, and anal. So that's more likely to be... more likely to be uh, hemorrhoidal in nature or something very close to the end of the colon. No, uh, diverticular bleeding is generally um, dark red in color, not black, dark red in color and gelled because it's had time to coagulate. So, um, and then just quantity, you, it's really hard to estimate the quantity of blood from the stool. Ask them, you know, if they've been vomiting into the toilet, you know, is, it whole, is the toilet in water entirely red or is it just streaky in spots? Is the stool totally bright red or is it just streaked in the stool? And then the important thing is, are they in shock? Do they have signs of shock? And your first thing is going to be simply tachycardia. Now, that might be because they're excited because they've seen blood in their stool. But, you know, you can determine shock, signs of shock. You know, if they, do they have orthostatic hypotension? Is there, um, you know, is their LOC different? Obviously, large bore IVs follow your general treatment guidelines. There's generally no pain associated with diverticular bleeding or, or tumorous bleeding. Your, your, your colon doesn't have much in the way of pain sensation. It has stretch. If, it's, if you distend the colon, it hurts. Ulcerative colitis, I'm going to flash right through because, you know, um, it's an idiopathic disease, inflammatory bowel disease, a lot of contributing factors to it. It's probably inherited uh, as much as anything. And then uh, um, uh, allergens, environmental things, uh, and psychological things work into it. And mostly it's just a chronic inflammatory condition with occasional bloody stools, colicky abdominal pain, cramping pain, nausea, vomiting, um, usually fever, uh, weight loss, uh, severe cases which we don't see much anymore uh, can have signs of shock. If they do, treat it. But uh, mostly they know they have it and they, they're on medication for it. The medication is getting much better for it nowadays. Uh, so, uh, matter of fact, you see 
hundreds of ads on TV now, which is where you get all the best medical information. Uh, uh, CNN, M MSNBC, watch those. You'll get the best things. Um, and there's all sorts of treatments now for it, which are, which are quite effective, but it takes them a minute to read through the side effects. Um, but people who have ulcerative colitis are happy to take something like this. Uh, you can treat them with antiemetics if they're nausea, if they have nausea and vomiting. Uh, treat them, uh, and and for, if they have pain, pain medication works. Obviously, you don't use pain medication if they're in shock. Crohn's disease. Um, is another chronic pathologic inflammation damaging the mucosa, mostly of the small intestine, but it can affect the entire GI tract, mostly the small intestine. Um, it, it's very similar in, as far as EMTs would be concerned, very similar to ulcerative colitis. Um, uh, it'll come to your attention with GI bleeding, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, if it's really severe, abdominal cramping. Uh, very seldom will be in shock, but if so, still just treat with, uh, with fluids and uh, treat the nausea, vomiting, and pain. Diverticulitis is infection or inflammation of diverticula. Diverticula are little out pockets of the mucosal lining. The, the problem with the colon, and these are all in the colon, the colon has, the colon has three bands of longitudinal muscle on them and there's no other muscle in the, in the colon. And so in between the bands of muscle, uh, the mucosa under pressure can bulge out and it can form a little, if it's got some weakness, it'll form a little out pocket. And diverticulosis runs in families, but it's also a chronic condition of Western civilization. Possibly because of what we eat, uh, and the fact that it causes increased intracolonic pressure, which predisposes to the little ballooning out, uh, partly because we walk on all, on two legs instead of four, so that you do have more pressure in your colon, partly because of poor bowel habits, uh, which increases you know, poor bowel habits and la lack of fiber in our diet, which inc increases the pressure in your colon, on and on and on. But suffice it to say, probably half of you in the room have one or two diverticula. And by the time you get to be my age, about 50% of you will have, I mean about 70% of you will have some diverticula. Now, that's not the end of the world. <laughs> if you have a lot of diverticula and you're bowel habits are still not good in your diet. Sometimes you will get these little, these little bulges will get packed with stool, packed with foodstuffs. Bacteria will get a little bit too frisky in it and cause an inflammation, an infection. Things can happen from that. Abdominal pain, tenderness, and with peritoneal signs, so Pain in the right lower in the left lower quadrant with rebound tenderness is very often diverticulitis, and it can these can rupture. They can cause an abscess in the local area, so you can get peritonitis, and they can rupture internally, causing GI bleeding. And it's the most common cause of GI of lower GI bleeding in the older population. How do you treat it? You treat it just like you treat everything else. Evaluate the patient. 
treat for comfort, treat if it's really painful, treat with pain meds. Unless they're shocky, you treat shock. Almost never associate with nausea and vomiting until they give you the medication you need to, to prep yourself for the, for the emergency colonoscopy. <laughs> I tell you that from, from personal experience. Okay, hemorrhoids. I already mentioned the cause of hemorrhoids is increased pressure in the portal vein. That can occur normally, and also because we stand on our hind legs, so you have increased pressure just by gravity, always. Straining, if you have poor bowel habits and you have to strain to have a bowel movement, you increase the pressure and push blood downward to that terminal vein. It can cause hemorrhoids. It can increase the hemorrhoids. If you have portal hypertension from cirrhosis, you have hemorrhoids. If you have pregnancy, you have increased pressure on the inferior vena cava and the portal vein pushing downward, causing hemorrhoids. Hemorrhoids can bleed if they erode. Hemorrhoids can bleed, causing severe, causing a lot of, causing bright red bleeding And usually, because it's, the hemorrhoid is inflamed at that point, it'll, it'll be painful. And it may even be thrombosed at that point, which means the blood, because the blood is pooled in there, it doesn't move quickly, it will clot, and you get a clot inside the hemorrhoid, which is very painful. People really like to come to the emergency room for that one. The biggest thing about hemorrhoidal bleeding, usually it's not life-threatening. The biggest thing about hemorrhoidal bleeding is, is blowing off someone who's got rectal bleeding and saying, oh, it's just a hemorrhoid without taking into consideration it might be some GI bleeding, some lower GI bleeding associated with that. Treatment of hemorrhoids, you're probably never going to have to worry about it. We treat it by, if it's a thrombose hemorrhoid, you, re, you remove the clot. Excise, cut a hole in the hemorrhoid, evacuate the clot, and it'll heal. Bowel obstruction. A true emergency. Um, so what happens with bowel obstruction? The, there's a blockage either internally or... or um, there's a blockage of the inside of, the, uh, of either the small or large intestine, uh, either partial or complete, and it could be from external blockage or from internal blockage. Now, you can have hernias, intussusception, which is a picture of this. Intussusception, if you can imagine a sock, your intestine is a sock, grab the toe of the sock and pull it inside. That's an intussusception, a piece of your bowel. Usually, it's got a. Um, it's usually it's small in a uh, small intestine. Can be col colon, particularly in in children. Um, it gets either inflamed or it gets a leading edge, which is kind of edematous, and f heavier than it should be, and it gets actually caught up with the with the peristaltic movement of the intestine and it gets pulled inside, in, into itself and it sort of everts then it's like the sock, pulling the sock inside out. What that does, of course, is the part that got pulled in all of a sudden now is trapped and it shuts off the blood supply. And it'll start bleeding a little bit inside but it mostly will get uh, it'll start to necrose, it'll start to die. So the, we want to fix the end of susception fairly quickly before that bowel dies. Um, volvulus it occurs mostly in the colon, and the colon, due to adhesions, due to a number of things, will twist on itself. Usually it happens 
Volvius happens either very young or the very old, usually when the colon has gotten sort of distended by poor bowel habits and things over a long period of time, and it gets really excessively mobile and excessively big, and it'll roll on itself, sort of like making a, uh, making a balloon animal. Uh, you, you turn it, but once again, if you get it turned too tight, you close off both ends, you cut off the blood supply to that whole sausage of colon. Hernias, uh, most common in males, although women get them as well. Uh, and you can get either an indirect or a direct hernia. An indirect hernia, which is really doesn't make any sense, it's, it should be called a direct hernia because what happens is there's a, there's a potential space um, in, in the male, you're, you're just a month or so before birth, uh, your testes migrate from where they start embryologically at the level of the kidney. They migrate through the abdomen, down through the inguinal canal and into the scrotum, pulling their blood vessels, artery, vein, and nerve along with it. It's not a painful process. <laughs> what, the reason, so, but it, so they start at the level of the kidney, which is why when you get need in the groin, you get severe pain that takes your breath away in the mid-abdomen and back. That's where the nerve came from. That inguinal canal, that little canal space that the, that the testy mi migrated through, closes up, but it's always a potential space. And in an inguinal hernia, that potential space opens up and becomes a weak spot and, and, a, and it actually becomes this space and a piece of bowel migrates into that and gets trapped. When it gets really trapped, that's called an incarcerated hernia and that has the same thing. Any bowel that gets trapped starts cutting off the blood supply. A direct hernia is just a weak spot in the wall of the abdomen, there are th three muscle layers and a layer of fascia and a couple of things, and it gets a weak spot at where this junction is, and a bowel, a piece of, a bowel, piece of bowel, a piece of the omentum, a piece of the fat can protrude through that, get caught and trapped. The smaller the hernia opening, the more dangerous it is, because once it gets something in, it's difficult to get out. So a big hernia is better than a little hernia. Nevertheless, when it's acute, when they have acute pain and symptoms of nausea, vomiting, decrease in bowel tones because the bowel is trapped, um, uh, th that's an emergency. You treat it for treat them with pain. Treat them if they have any. Uh, abnormalities of their vital signs, transport, simple. Bowel obstruction, we've talked about, it may be hemodynamically unstable, can occur from also, this is diffuse visceral pain, it's not generally localized, or at least poorly localized. If they have Peritonitis, and if they have distension of the abdomen, peritonitis, signs of rebound, uh, it's severe. If they have, <clears throat> at the beginning of bowel obstruction, a lot of times your bowel sounds are hyperactive and then they go quiet because it's trying, the bowel is trying to push past the obstruction. So you get a lot of noise and then quiet. During the noise, during the time where they will probably have cramping Cramp, severe crampy pain during that time period. And you treat their physiologic findings. 
they're in shock, you treat them for shock. Treat them with pain medicine unless they're in shock. Airway management, the usual thing. Okay, accessory organs that we get called for. Liver, gallbladder, pancreas, and the appendix. Okay, appendicitis, inflammation of the vermiform appendix. The vermiform appendix is this little thing uh, that's at the end, of, the end of the ilium where the ilium and the cecum uh, colon come together. It's important for um, herbivores, uh, particularly uh, goats, sheep, etc., because it's another place where food is digested. Doesn't work for us. The only thing that ap the appendix really does for human beings is uh, support a lot of uh, surgeons, children going to college and things like that. It's just this blind pouch that, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a terrible design for human beings because you get, because stuff is gonna get in there and if the stuff gets in there, particularly if it gets packed in there and it starts to decrease the um, blood supply to the appendix, then bacteria can get in and cause a real inflammation which makes it worse and then they, you get this inflammatory <laughs> infected uh, little appendage that's in the right lower quadrant generally and if it gets inflamed it causes peritoneal irritation right there which is why we have the classic findings in appendicitis in classic appendicitis of diffuse colicky pain very poorly localized to start with As a matter of fact usually people complain of it in the mid abdomen Maybe in the in, in more, you think, well, are, are they having a little stomach upset? A little. But then it, as they develop more peritoneal, more inflammation, they begin to localize the pain classically into the right lower quadrant. It's called McBurney's Point because McBurney was a Scottish surgeon and that was where he, he decided, hey, this is where you make the incision to take the appendix out. Now, you think, why would that such, I mean, that's so common because this is, a, McBurney said, this is where you go for the, for the quickest finding and in and out of taking out the appendix because when McBurney started operating, they didn't have anesthesia. <laughs> so you had to get in and out real quick. Most people didn't like you to do that. So, they may have a low-grade fever and they may have nausea and vomiting. If they have severe peritoneal signs, not a good thing because the appendix can rupture, cause severe peritonitis, which is life-threatening. Now, by and large, you would treat, you know, your evaluation is the same thing. You think, well, I think they have an acute abdomen. I mean, Dr. Bell and I do not tell the surgeon, we think we have appendicitis. We tell them we have an acute surgical abdomen. It's not our job to, even though we know that's what it is, it's not our job to tell the surgeon that that's what it is. If we have an acute surgical emergency and it happens to be in the right lower quadrant. There's a few other things that live there, but most of the time, it's not important to make the diet, but we treat the patient then with fluids. Nowadays with antibiotics, you don't carry antibiotics yet. And um, uh, treat them for anything else that's treatable, transportable. Now, is it okay to give them pain medicine? Yes. You will not, you will not hide the findings of an acute abdomen, acute surgical abdomen from a competent surgeon or ER doc by giving, treating the patient for pain. Matter of fact, sometimes we can't even examine patients without treating them for pain because it's too painful. I'm thinking mostly of pelvic diseases and things, but 
Uh, okay, cholecystitis, an inflammation of the gallbladder. Now, it can be associated with cholelithiasis, which is gallstones, can be associated with chronic cholecystitis, which is a chronic bacterial infection, or can have what's called acolic, acalculus, no, no gallstones, cholecystitis, it's, that's associated post-burns, post-sepsis, diabetes are very common, and with multi-organ multi failure, shock syndromes after the fact, after you survive this. Um, this little picture here is your gallbladder. Find my little thing here. You have a gallbladder here, you've got stones in it, and you have a little air in the wall of the gallbladder, which means the chronic thing, and it's, you know, leaking a little air there. Classic symptoms, Murphy's sign, upper right quadrant abdominal pain. You push on the upper right quadrant and you have rebound tenderness. Push on the upper right quadrant and it hurts worse in the end of their, they also complain of usually shoulder blade, scapular pain. Nausea, vomiting. Often they'll have a history of, of having episodes like this before. Um, about half of the people that I see with acute cholecystitis will tell me that after they have, a, have had a fatty meal in the past, pizza, something, they often get heartburn. A lot of times they, they feel like it's heartburn only, right upper, you know, mid and right upper quadrant pain. Um, acute cholecystitis, pain medications, but the, and nausea medications. They will not be shocky, probably, <laughs> unless they've ruptured their gallbladder, which is pretty unusual. Now, cholelithiasis, which we didn't put in here, is much more common, and that's when you get uh, acute, acute gallstones, you'll get a, gall, a, a stone stuck in the, usually the common duct. Uh, as it's trying to pass through the stomach. And that causes severe pain, gallbladder pain, right upper quadrant pain, nausea, vomiting, and they will often, they will often become jaundiced shortly because it obstructs the, the common duct, also drains the, uh, it drains the liver, drains the pancreas. So when, if you totally block all liver uh, drainage, you end up with jaundice. Pancreatitis, um, we see a lot of common causes of pancreatitis is alcohol abuse, gallstones, because when you get the gallstone stuck in the common duct, it backs, liver bile backs up into the pancreas, which causes acute and severe inflammation. It's associated often with diabetes and elevated serum lipids, fats. Excess fats your pancreas doesn't like very much. Some drugs, some of which we give people, some of which they take themselves, uh, will cause pancreatitis, inflammation. Mild pancreatitis is severe epigastric pain, often with abdominal distension, nausea, vomiting, and then we will test them for elevated pancreatic enzymes. Severe pancreatitis, epigastric pain, and often back pain, severe back pain, because it, it's basically part of the pancreas is retroperitoneal, so when it gets really inflamed, it's behind the peritoneum and it causes severe backache, almost like kidney disease. Severe pancreatitis often has re pretty refractory shock. May have blood loss associated as well, but severe shock. 
And by refractory, I mean it's not going to respond just to a little bit of fluids. We may have to, we may, we may have to put the patient on pressors to get them through that. Respiratory failure is not uncommon with severe pancreatitis. Hepatitis. Yeah. No, uh, what, what, no. What you're thinking of actually uh, with with gallbladder disease, we used to be a little reluctant to give to give morphine to um, um, to people with gallstones and and probable gallstone uh, disease uh, because. Uh, morphine would sometimes cause a spasm of the sphincter of Adi, which is the outlet to the common duct. And that would increase the pain <laughs> rather than not. And the reason it's associated with pain is because that would have a tendency then to increase that blockage and maybe get back up into the pancreas, which might cause pancreatitis if it hadn't already occurred from the gallbladder. Um, so that's in those days, the, with more, and so it's, fentanyl doesn't seem to have the same issue that morphine did. Uh, in the old days, we used, to, we used to preferentially, at least I used to treat people with gallbladder pain with, with uh, Demerol which is, of course has totally fallen out of favor nowadays because of the DEA and the, because of the abuse of Demerol. But, uh, you know, I didn't abuse it, so that was okay. So, but the good question, no. Go, feel, feel, say, feel free to use the fentanyl. The worst, the worst thing that fentanyl causes that, uh, to me is nausea. <laughs> you know, some people get kind of sick with it. Um, hepatitis, injury to liver cells due to inflammation or infection, generally due to a viral infection. Now, you can get hepatitis from alcohol, you can get hepatitis from other drugs, so you have, but the most common hepatitis and the one that you guys are concerned about is viral hepatitis, and it comes in now A, B, C, D, E, and G flavors. Risk factors are some of the above, body piercing, tattooing, pregnancy, because it can be passed from maternal to child, uh, blood transfusions, cause the hep uh, and, uh, and uh, multi-sexual multi partners. Those are all the causes of hepatitis C. Hepatitis A is foodborne. Waterborne. Hepatitis A, infectious hepatitis, classic old fashioned hepatitis, fecal oral route. Generally, the children would bring it home to the, to the family. Uh, hepatitis A almost disappeared in the United States due to what? Dishwashers. Because the the heat and the soap, but the heat mostly kills hepatitis A. Because this is all, uh, a lot of it was foodborne, trans and, and, and of course dishwashing in, in restaurants made a big difference too. You know, that's why the, you know, if you don't have a dishwasher in a restaurant, you have to have three different uh, sinks. You do the pre-rinse, the, and then the, a bacterial, a virucidal killer, and bacterial killer, and, and then a, another rinse through it. It's all of X amount of heat too. So hepatitis A still occurs commonly. It's still fecal oral route. One of the common ways of getting it in the United States is through um, shellfish, uh, oysters, and the straining kind of things that that have been you know, we, we, we dump all of our waste into the ocean ultimately and uh, that's a good place to get it. Now you can get a, 
you can get immunized for hepatitis A. It's very easy to do. Hepatitis A is not a terrible disease usually. Um, it lasts two to eight weeks. You get tired, you get jaundiced, you feel icky, but it goes away. And it doesn't really cause much trouble. Now, just like any other viral disease, it's totally immunogenic so that if you get it once, you'll never get it again. Hepatitis B, serum hepatitis, usually has fairly minimal effects, but the downside is some people get severe liver disease, severe ischemia and necrosis, and it can lead to uh, hepatomas and other things. And the effect, the, the, the hepatitis is a little bit more virulent in the sense you feel a lot worse. Hepatitis C is what we found out we could transmit through blood transfusions. Now we test for hepatitis C in all the blood transfusions. Hepatitis D is hardly testable for, and it's dormant until it's activated by hepatitis B. It's transmitted by, generally by um, uh, intravenous drug use, um, other, possibly by blood transfusions and by uh, uh, sexual contact. Hepatitis E is a third world disease. It's waterborne. It's probably a relative more of hepatitis A than anything else. Hepatitis G is a super infector. <laughs> if you have hepatitis A or B or C, you can get super infected with hepatitis G. Apparently, it's just a, 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 a hanger-oner, sort of, that takes advantage of the fact. Signs and symptoms of hepatitis are pretty universal. Upper right quadrant abdominal tenders, because the, 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 the liver swells and it squeezes, the, it pushes on the capsule. Loss of appetite, weight loss, malaise, just don't feel good, lazy, you know. Clay-colored stool, because the liver isn't processing blood, so it's not and normally, so it's not putting out um, um, the um, um, bilirubin into the stool, which is part of normal liver bile, which turns your stool brown in color. So your stool becomes clay colored. Then you get jaundice and scleral icterus because you've got increased bilirubin now dissolved in plasma because it can't get out through liver bile. And jaundice causes, and scleroelectric cause photophobia, they're, they're light sensitive and nausea, vomiting, and often severe itching from bilirubin. Treatment besides put, putting your gloves on when you take care of people, um, <clears throat> it's not transmitted by, it's not transmitted by uh, by droplets, so you're safe in that regard. Vaccinations. Vaccinations are available for B. Everybody in our in our in our profession should have hepatitis B vaccine, and then you don't have to worry about it. And so far, we don't see any need to to boost the hepatitis B vaccine. Once you get it, should take care of it. Um, you might, if you had a severe exposure, uh, bloodborne exposure, uh, they might suggest getting, uh, getting another booster at that time, but most people don't. It seems to be effective for the whole time. Um, type A, you can get vaccinated for also if you like to eat shellfish. It's a good idea. Or go to other countries. Okay, I want you to take a five minute break. I think pretty good case reviews and also a, a little bit of a change in, not a change as much as a slight morphing of our uh, stroke um, 
directions. So uh, don't run away when we get done with the urology. Okay. The urinary system is rather important for most of it. It means because it does a lot of vital functions that you don't think, when you think of kidneys, you don't generally think of anything except making urine. But kidneys maintain your blood volume, proper balance of water, electrolytes, and pH, acid-base balance, removes a lot of toxic waste from the blood, maintains your arterial blood pressure, controls the development of red blood cells. So it's not just for making urine. Kidney is made up of the hilum, which is the stem. It's the medulla, which is your basic kidney function. The pyramids of the kidney, which are part of that medulla that then drain into the papilla, which is the draining thing, which drains into the renal pelvis, uh, which goes into the ureter. The action in the kidney happens at the level of the nephron. The nephron consists of the glomerulus, which is um, a little ball-like thing here, which has an artery running into it and a vein running out of it, so it has a lot of capillary stuff here. And at this level, the untreated blood arrives at the glomerulus and it starts to, by diffusion and facilitated diffusion, starts to create urine. Urine is basically an exudate to start with, and it has within it everything that would pass through the membrane of the, of the artery. So it has water, it has solutes, it has some sugar, it has all sorts of, and it has various waste products of your body like urea, um, things that are broken down from protein. It has other, and dr some drugs, and this all goes into this collecting duct, the proximal tubule. The proximal tubule winds along down this thing. It has a kind of a narrowed area here, which is kind of interesting, um, um, which basically increases the surface area a little bit. But it has veins surrounding it all along this way. And during, this, during the descending loop, things don't change too much. Uh, some water is extracted. Um, and on the upswing, the ascending loop that's going by, the, the, at this level, there's more diffusion and some things are, some things are selectively taken back from the pre-urine. Pre like glucose is selectively reabsorbed. Um, some of your potassium and sodium, some of the sodium is selectively reabsorbed. Some potassium is reabsorbed. Things that are, you know, important to get are reabsorbed. Um, so that it is no longer a pure exudate, it's, a, it's an adjusted thing. Some, and then urea is selectively transferred into the pre-urine by, uh, by a facilitated diffusion, which brings glucose out. The net effect is by the time you get up here, it's had, sort of had a processing and reprocessing, and then you have urine, which true urine appears, the final product appears in the distal tubule and then drains into the collecting ducts which go into the, to the uh, renal pelvis and the, and the ureter. So you've got glomerular filtration, which is called the GFR, glomerular filtration rate. 
uh, which we can measure nowadays, and then reabsorption and, and secretion at different levels, which is diffusion and osmosis, and then facilitated diffusion with active transport in the ascending limb. This is all adjusted by various and sundry um, hormonal thing. So the tubules handle water and electrolytes. So this is where diuresis and antidiuresis occurs. Glucose and urea are handled in the ascending limb usually. Arterial blood pressure is controlled by the renin-angiotensin system. And erythropoietin is produced, it's a hormone produced by the kidney, which is produced in response to lower or higher amounts of oxygen tension in red blood cells, which then translates to are there enough red blood cells or not enough red blood cells. So erythropoietin is produced when the kidney senses low oxygen tension in the red cells to make more red cells. Okay. Now obviously you can have trauma which damage the kidney, but most non-traumatic kidney issues are inflammatory or immune-related diseases such as post-streptococcal post uh, glomerulonephritis. It's an immune response to the strep bacteria, which is why we treat strep throats not, not because it's a bad strep throat. We treat it because of the immunologic aftermath. You either get kidney disease or heart disease. Neither one is acceptable to us. Infectious diseases can obviously affect the kidney, mostly they're bacterial infections, physical obstruction and or hemorrhage in the kidney from non-traumatic sources which, you know, can occur. Now, assessment and management, um, nothing, nothing is usually very particular about uh, acute kidney injury except that patients are generally feeling uncomfortable if they have an inflammatory process going on in the kidney they like to lay flat with their knees drawn up even though they do get some relief off because they, they have retroperitoneal pain so they don't like to stretch the, re, the posterior retroperitoneum interesting that they're better up walking so they may be pacing about. Um, skin color, chronic kidney disease, the patient looks kind of gray, ashen, uh, more gray than anything, and they may even have uh, uh, signs of uh, uremia, which are uh, sort of a, a funny powdery look to their, uh, around their lips. Um, Inspect the abdomen for distension, ecchymosis, scarring. If they have, sometimes we can uh, check them with palpation of the abdomen and percussion. Our, our, our usual thing for checking for kidney-related pain is to do a percussion, a, a tap over the retro, the, over the back area, uh, just under the rib cage. Uh, put a hand on it, whack your own hand, and uh, that will elicit quite a bit of discomfort if it's kidney inflammation. Not so much for, you know, that won't hurt you or me if we do it otherwise. Obviously, the normal, you know, renal, renal disease is no different than anything else. ABCs, um, IV access, analgesics if they're having pain. Uh, we don't give them anything by mouth position of comfort, etc. Now, sudden, you know, acute emergencies, acute renal failure. Acute renal failure is sudden drop in urine output to less than 400 to 500 cc's per day or 30 cc's, generally 30 to 50 cc's per hour in the 
in the adult. Now, I do not want you waiting at the scene to see if this guy has two or 300 cc's of output. That is not your job. They will tell you that they're not urinating very much. So it's oliguria, little bit of urine. Now the acute renal failure can occur from pre-renal renal failure, which is dysfunction before the level of the kidneys. It's the most common, it's the most common thing you're gonna see. And we'll get to that in a second. Renal acute renal failure, which is dysfunction within the kidneys themselves, acutely. And post-renal acute renal failure, which is dysfunction distal of the kidneys. Now, the, this is where it breaks out. Pre-renal acute renal failure can occur from hypovolemia, hemorrhage, dehydration burns. This is one of the things we, you know, when you, when you bring us a trauma patient and we're going through the resuscitation, one of the considerations is that we need to get someone up to having enough renal output so that they can avoid pre-renal acute renal failure. Because once you don't have enough arterial supply blood pressure going to the kidneys, the kidneys begin to have failure because they don't have enough blood supply. So that's why we're so, we push so much to resuscitate trauma patients, hemorrhagic patients. Don't forget, dehydration and burns is the same thing. In the burn units, they're all, they're all over someone with, you know, that's why they've come up with the Parkland and other burn formulas to try to drive those kidneys. Cardiac failure by itself. Myocardial infarction, congestive heart failure, vascular disease, arteriosclerotic, diabetes, causing pre-renal arterial dysfunction. <laughs> then there are arterial stenosis things. That, so cardiovascular shock. Shock is the most common cause that we're going to see in the hospital of acute renal failure. I can tell you, almost all of the people who you brought in from a cardiac arrest who had, had ROSC but had difficulty in us keeping their blood pressure up in the first 48 hours, they almost all have some version of acute renal failure. And the same thing for the STEMIs who have a difficulty with cardiac output after their STEMI, even if they get their STEMI fixed. For a while, they will have decreased left ventricular function. It's a shock. They have acute renal failure. You usually don't go to terminal acute renal failure, but they have, they have a problem. They have to be adjusted through, the, through, through that post post-shock issue. Now, renal, acute renal failure due to small vessel glomerular damage, so that's diabetes, number one, and that's the most common cause of renal, chronic and acute renal failure. So almost all your dialysis patients are gonna be diabetic too, because acute renal failure goes to chronic renal failure. So acute, uh, immune causes, uh, acute glomerular nephritis after having a strep infection, other things. There are some um, hypertension can cause acute renal, fa uh, renal, renal failure, small vessel disease. Tubular damage from ischemia or from toxins, interstitial damage, uh, allergic reactions, things like that. No, so most common though are small vessel glomerular damage. Now, post-renal acute renal failure is abrupt obstruction of both ureters due to stones, kidney stones, blood clots, tumors, or abrupt obstruction, and pay attention because you will get older, abrupt, ab ab abrupt obstruction of the bladder neck, which is generally due to benign prostatic hypertrophy. 
stones, tumor clots, things like that, but BPH. And uh, mostly stones and things, we'll call, uh, kidney stones, and we'll talk about that a little bit. So acute renal fa failure, history, change in urine output, well, you know, that's, if the guy's in a car wreck and they're, and they're hypotensive, you're not gonna get much of a history of that. But uh, uh, an inflammatory, a small vessel uh, problem, a diabetic problem, they will complain, they will have a change in urine output, swelling of hands, feet, and torso. They'll actually, uh, Dr. Bell, we were talking about one just a bit ago, um, that presented at the emergency department with what's called anasarca, generalized edema, including intra-abdominal uh, excess fluid, and uh, the initial treatment was to take, what, eight liters of eight liters of fluid off the abdomen just to get, just to make things better for this person. Um, often with acute renal failure, you get heart palpitations, irregularity, or we're gonna get some changes in potassium. Changes in mental function. And uh, so, physical assessment, altered mental status, hypertension. Hypertension often because of retaining uh, sodium, uh, potassium, um, and changes in the ang angiotensin renin function. Tachycardia. EKG evidence of hyperkalemia, so peaked T waves. Generally speaking, the T waves are often almost as big as the QRSs in wh wherever they are, but definitely this is not a normal looking, this is, this is a red flag right off the bat, a super high peaked T wave. Pale, cool, moist skin, edema, face and hands, feet. Hey, what's new for the, what's new for the treatment pre-hospital? Pre Airway, breathing, circulation, IV access. Um, unless they're shocky, you probably don't want to give them any fluids other than just the maintenance level. If they're on, if they're on certain antibiotics, certain other nephrotoxic medications, we would we would stop that. You are obviously not going to give people their own home medications on on uh, on your evaluation treatment. Acute renal failure goes on to so what well, we, we we treat the symptoms of acute renal failure. So if they're hyperkalemic and acute renal failure often makes, becomes hyperkalemic and it can occur in the presence of burns, uh, burns of, that are more than usually four to five days old, crush injuries, uh, including just little old people laying in one place for a long period of time because they've broken a hip or something or had a stroke, uh, crush injury. Uh, of one or two hours in duration can, can cause acute renal failure and increase in potassium. Um, then there's chronic renal failure. Acute renal failure can often go on to chronic renal failure because that just means you have permanent loss of the nephrons. Um, and essentially you have chronic renal, renal acute renal failure. Microangiography, glomerular disease associated with diabetes, tubular cell injury, interstitial injuries. Uh, you will often have chronic pitting edema. Pitting edema indicates that edema has been there for a while. And it also indicates there's some changes in your, um, uh, in your fluid and electrolytes, which cause it, Pitting just means when you push down, take your hand away, you still have your thumbprint. Normally that doesn't happen to us. Test yourself at home. Call me. 
chronic, re so chronic renal failure, the most common cause of systemic hypertension, diabetes, mellitus, atherosclerosis, etc. Um, tubular cell injury, some, some analgesics cause severe nephrotoxicity. And one of the reasons we don't like people on chronic um, NSAIDs, ibuprofen, for example, is it's nephrotoxic can cause tubular cell injury. Um, interstitial injuries caused by infections such as pyelonephritis, uh, 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 bacterial infection of the collecting system. Chronic tuberculosis of the kidney is a little uncommon. Now what you get with chronic renal failure is an extension of acute of what you get with acute renal failure, just that it's chronic. And with chronic renal failure, you get impairment of your normal kidney function. Your normal kidney function is maintaining your blood volume with the proper balance of water, electrolytes, and pH. So the opposite of that, when you have renal failure, is increased sodium retention, increased water, and increased potassium retention. You've lost, the kidney's lost the ability to adjust for those things. Kidney also tries to retain key components such as glucose by, ex by actively exchanging that with urea. So what happens with chronic renal disease is you get a loss of glucose. You get more glucose through the, through the urine and you retain urea. So, you, so we test one of the signs of chronic and acute renal failure is we do a blood urea nitrogen or a creatinine test, which is more accurate, which shows that you've got increased retention of uh, these metabolic waste products, which are ultimately toxic to you. So it's in chronic renal failure always has elevation of creatinine and, and BUN. Your arterial blood pressure is controlled by the renin angiotensin loop, so the absence of that control or the disruption of that control means the patient becomes hypotensive, which ultimately has more damage to the kidney and more likely strokes, more likely cardiac disease, acute myocardial infarction, et cetera. Then chronic renal failure because of the, the erythropoietin dysfunction, you end up with chronic anemia. So all of your, most of your people on, on, who are on dialysis, chronic renal failure will also be anemic, chronically anemic. They'll have increased blood volume, perhaps, because of retention of sodium and water, but they'll be anemic. Now, sometimes it's hard to differentiate from chronic and, and acute problems because you're going you're gonna to get called to someone with chronic renal failure, probably known because they're on, di they're on dialysis, because they have an acute problem. That's how we get involved. So your focus history will... And, and your history from the family will tell you whether this is probably a chronic renal failure patient or not. Uh, a lot of times people will say, well, they told me I have borderline kidney failure, but I've never been on dialysis. Well, that means that, you know, if they have borderline kidney failure, sooner or later they're going to have kidney failure. They're going to have acute renal failure. GI, often they'll have GI complaints, nausea, vomiting, sometimes some diarrhea, curiously associated with it. Changes in mental status, uh, if they're, particularly if their electrolytes are really out of whack. Uh, you probably find evidence of hypertension. You probably find evidence of hyperkalemia on your 12 lead. Uh, they may have, uh, like I say, the end stage, end stage renal function. They get a sort of a, it's called uremic frost. They get uh, urea actually depositing on, on their skin from sweat. 
Oh. So we already went through all those. We don't have to do that. Now, chronic renal failure, how do you manage it? Monitor, support, ABCs, IV access. If they're hypotensive, they need fluids. They probably will be hypertensive unless they're in acute cardiac failure also at the time. Monitor vital signs, cardiac rhythm, and how do you treat hyperkalemia? What's our, what's our formula for hyperkalemia? First drug, calcium. Or you might say, well, first drug is the fastest. I'll put them on an albuterol mednib. Albuterol drops everybody's potassium, yours, mine, everybody, including the hyperkalemic, by 0 0.5. So that's a good start, and it's quick, and it's easy. You get your, you get your EMT to help you set that up. You, know. you get the IVN, and then they get calcium. And we're using calcium gluconate now mostly. Uh, I think most of the calcium chloride has disappeared now. It just We let it run out. Calcium gluconate is better. Um, and then bicarbonate. Either flush the line or start another line and run, run that bicarbonate in the other line because bi bicarbonate and calcium makes rocks, and rocks are not good in your vein. Um, and then what? If the patient is a diabetic and has his, own, his or her own regular insulin at home, check, check your, you're doing an AMS anyway, check your glucose. If your glucose is normal or low, give them 10 grams of glucose IV and chase it with five units of regular insulin. Regular, not the long acting, because that'll take, that'll take effect later today. You want it to take effect now. Now, if they're frankly hyperglycemic, just give them some, the insulin if they have it. And that usually, that's just about what you have to do. Can you repeat it? Yeah, you could repeat, you could repeat particularly the, the calcium and the, and the bicarbonate if you have a 45 minute to an hour and a half trip, but most of you don't, so you won't have to do it. Okay, renal calculi, stones, there's too much insoluble stuff or too concentrated urine and the stone and you get a little nidus of these uh, uh, either salts or some uric acid crystals that begins to precipitate out of solution. It's like, remember when you were, maybe you guys didn't do this, when we were kids we used to, we used to make rock gardens, make, mix super saturated salt and then put a little crystal in it and it would, and it will precipitate out and make, make a pretty crystal stone. Um, well, pretty crystals are good in a little, in a little terrarium kind of box, but they're not very good if it happens to be in your, in your kidneys or in the, or in the renal collecting system. Usual, usual things are calcium salts, um, struvite, which is um, more of a proteinish, proteinaceous thing, uh, uric acid or cysteine crystal. Uric acid is a Interesting, it's one of the pre-urea um, chemicals. So your proteins become, go through a process of being broken down um, into urea and then into, uh, or, or in, uh, uric acid and then into urea. Um, urea is very soluble in water. Uric acid is not so soluble, so it can precipitate out. And some of us have a tendency to make too much uric acid that we call that gout. Uh, it's a metabolic abnormality. 
Um, so when the stones precipitate out, they, are, they can become medium sized and pass down the ureter easily. If they become big enough so they stick in the ureter, then they begin to, the ureter for some odd reason has more nerves per square inch than does your, than do your fingertips or your tongue or anything else. It doesn't make any sense because, but when the stone, when the uric acid stone is, or the, any stone, renal stone goes down the ureter, it's, it's, if it's tight enough, it fit, and it's kind of rough, so it scratches on the, on the lining of the ureter, and that causes a lot of pain. And people complain of the worst, that this is the worst pain they've ever had. Now, obviously, most of these are men who are, who've never had children, <laughs> childbirth. So, uh, generally, classic history is severe pain in one flank because the, the, the ureters hang up, stones hang up two points where it comes out of the renal hilum that narrows. So that's a narrow spot. There's another narrow spot as the, and it's just a physical narrowing where the, uh, the ureter comes over the, uh, enters the pelvis. There's a slight raise and a little kink there. So that's a narrow spot that it hurts. Then another narrow spot is where it goes into the bladder, the ureter. So pain starts in one flank, increases intensity, and gradually as this migrates down the ureter, it, the pain migrates from the flank to the groin. Then it goes away if it drops in, if the stone passes and goes into the, the bladder. Now, there may be, uh, there's often frequent urination, because you're trying to, this, nature's way of getting rid of this is to push it through. That's why when, he, when you give, when I give someone a fluid bolus with renal pain, it often makes it worse for a second or two, and then it goes away as they pass the stone. Once the stone passes, the pain goes away. They may have a little bit of bloody urine because this thing scratches the lining of the, of the ureter and can cause some minor bleeding. They usually have a prior history of calculus, unless this is the first time. Uh, they can't find usually a position of comfort. They like to move around a little bit. You can elicit flank pain sometimes, but the classic history starts in the back and, and migrates and rolls downhill. Now, if it doesn't go, if it can't be pushed through, then, now, generally speaking, if you treat them with pain medication, that helps them to relax and it'll, and it'll improve path. That plus a little fluid bolus, they usually pass. But you're treating them, and they'll often be really nauseated with this too. So they can get an anti-nausea drug, some pain medication, transport in position of comfort, usually sitting with legs drawn up. Um, we may be, because we're, we're concerned with, with, the, with, the, with the current problem with um, pain medications, we're, we're having trouble getting narcotics. Uh, we're, I'm considering putting um, injectable non on which non which is toradol. Uh, that that's good for a lot of pain. As a matter of fact, that 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 totally took away my discomfort from my my last chest disaster, uh, rib pain. Um, and it uh, we use it. We've been using it in the ER for what 25 years at least for as an adjunct to kidney stones too, kidney pain. Uh, we give that along with pain medication. Uh, but uh, probably there's no reason to think that we couldn't use it all by itself if we had to. More news on that, probably the, I wouldn't add that to the summer for you. Um, 
couple other emergencies. Uh, uh, testicular torsion obviously only occurs in 50% of the population, uh, generally adolescent. Um, and it's a maldevelopment of the fixation. Remember, I, I told you the, the testis migrated down from the level of the kidney uh, prior to birth, and then it's normally a, firmly attached in the scrotum where it belongs. But sometimes that attachment is, is incomplete, and it allows the testis to rotate and sometimes it totally, so it, when it rotates and twists on itself, it twists its supportive structure, which includes the artery and the vein and the nerve for that matter. But, so that causes pain, but it also puts the testicle at risk because if, if, the, if it becomes ischemic for X amount of time, it dies. So, um, sometimes associated with trauma, sometimes occurs during sleep, um, sometimes occurs during athletic activity, but I've never seen it happen myself. So uh, mostly they wake up in the middle of the night with pain in the groin. And that's what they get. They get pain in the lower abdomen and, and all the way up sometimes to mid-abdomen, because remember, that's where the nerve started. Uh, so they get pain, achy pain, sometimes really acutely achy pain, nausea, vomiting, um, and examination would show that it's swollen and tender. And treated for you know, discomfort nausea, vomiting, bring them to the hospital, and we take them and detorse this. You can't, un once, when it gets stuck, you can't usually do it manually. You have to take them to the, to the operating room, put them uh, anesthesia, rotate it back where it belongs, make sure it's viable still, and then tack it down, surgically tack it down. Uh, urinary tract infection, we see a lot of those, and the worst part that we see uh, uh, increased risk in female, increased risk in patients with, catheter, with catheters, increased risk of chronic urinary tract infection in older people who don't empty their bladder and are in nursing home situations and relatively inactive, and that's just the way it is. And the worst part that we see is people who get, older people who get renal sepsis. You get urinary tract sepsis from their, re, from their infection, which is both a chronic and then an acute infection. And then they get acute renal failure with that. And sepsis, lower blood pressure, causes renal failure if they didn't have it to start with. Urinary tract infections come as just simple urethritis, which is painful, hurts when you pee. Cystitis, which is bladder infection, also hurts. Frequent urination hurts when you urinate, maybe blood in the urine. Prostatitis, inflammation of the prostate, causes frequent urination, maybe urinary retention at times causes um, um, discomfort. Pyelonephritis, which is an infection of the kidney, usually an ascending infection comes from, works upstream from the bladder, causes severe fever, nausea, vomiting, sometimes um, uh, sepsis, uh, causes um, severe pain in the flank, in the back. Most of the, most of the uh, infections that we see are community acquired, just normal bacteria, but you can get infections that are specific to institutions, to nursing homes, to hospitals, such as Pseudomonas, which is not a good infection to get. Um, 
most of your urinary tract infections are caused by E. coli or similar bacteria. Uh, but the, the bad ones are, the, uh, are, are Pseudomonas and uh, a few of the others. Usually urinary tract infection, abdominal pain, frequent pa painful urination, burning when urinating, um, hard to start, hard to stop. <laughs> uh, we all know we all know the joy of going into a, a nursing home and walking into a room and saying, "Yep, there's urinary tract infection here. You can smell it." Um, often they'll have past episodes urinary tract infection. Um, your assessment is mostly their LOC, their presence of a fever. Sometimes, obviously, severe sepsis has no fever. They're hypothermic. Uh, vital signs, uh, particularly if, they, if they're uh, in sepsis, if they are showing our usual signs of sepsis and shock. Maintain blood uh, ABCs, IV access. Okay, now somewhere here I have my case reviews. There we go. All right. Okay, case reviews. Now, this is gonna be a slight change in your stroke, in your stroke uh, protocol. And this is occasioned by Southwest starting uh, what is uh, what is a, uh, um, a CT perfusion study uh, now for strokes, severe strokes, which, which all the studies is, is the current, it's the current approach to strokes uh, of undetermined age. You do a perfusion to see how much of the brain is actually involved with edema, how much is involved with actual ischemia so that it's, by definition, not viable. So this is, a, this is going to allow us to move out the interventional time for stroke from what right now you have a wake-up stroke or eight hours to take to an intervention center such as Southwest. This will allow us to move that number out to 24 hours. So many of these patients will still be, a will still be able to have intervention even if they're out 24 hours from their onset of symptoms. So we're moving the eight-hour thing to 24 hours. This is going to begin the 1st of May. So your emergent transport to P-South Southwest will be less than 24 onset of the following symptoms. Last year, we made the change. We added a couple things to the LAM score. The state has the LAM score, Los Angeles Motor Score, uh, and, but the, the LAM score misses a couple things. It doesn't take into effect aphasia. I mean, look, if, you, if, if I had a stroke, if you had a stroke, you'd probably want to get intervention for the things that would really make a difference. I mean, if you, if you, have, uh, if you have a little facial numbness, if that's the only thing you have from your stroke, you don't need major intervention. And you probably wouldn't want it because there's some risk with major intervention. But if you can't speak because you have aphasia, or if you can't remember how to speak because you have aphasia, or if you make only nonsense words because of your aphasia, you probably want that fixed if you could. I know, I, yeah, I think I would. Um, so the following, you, you, we have you now go through 
um, the BFAST, which includes balance and the presence or absence of any loss of vision in one eye or the other or one visual field, that will buy you a trip to a major stroke intervention center. So aphasia, facial droop with unilateral weakness or paresthesia, inability to understand others or verbalize, loss of vision in one eye or visual field, sudden onset of vertigo, because that could be a posterior stroke, and a LAM score, a LAM score and or the LAM score. So we only want severe strokes because those are the ones you get intervention. But now we can move that out to 24 hours. How many people does that, well, we looked at that yesterday at the numbers and that probably accounts for maybe five to 10% of all the strokes you see will fall. You know, mo most people when they have those symptoms are gonna call you. Uh, we already, we've already told you if they wake up with severe stroke symptoms, take them to the interventional center. So we're not gonna catch that many more, but a few more. And even, even one or two makes a lot of difference. Okay, first case. Accidental poisoning of a two-year-old. Mother had some clonidine from a friend. Now, why in the world anybody has clonidine from a friend is beyond me. a friend, you know. Well, you're gonna find out in a minute why. It was in her makeup bag. There were at least 12 pills in the bag. At least she got a dozen. Uh, she found her son, two-year-old, with the bag in his, mouth, in his mouth, and he'd been chewing on the corner. All of the pills had dissolved, and the, so the kid had, had at least 12. The patient could not hold his head up, appeared to be semi-responsive and lethargic, called poison control. Was anybody on this call? Here? Okay. Called poison control and advised the amount he took as a toxic level. Yeah, one clonidine is toxic for a two-year-old. Now. What else did they tell you? Yeah. Okay. Did they tell you to give them any Narcan? What a bunch of dopes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, but you know, you have nasal. And yes, I am. But. Poison control should have told you, do you or should have asked you, do you have Narcan? Because the antidote for clonidine is Narcan. <laughs> it would have been helpful. I mean, you know, that's why, I mean, I, 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 I was hard, I was hard to believe. I mean, we will be chatting with, I will be chatting with poison control about, hey, you know, this wasn't all the right information. Yes, and you should be prepared to intubate him. But the Narcan made it, would have probably turned it around. At any rate, he got a load and go, uh, transferred to code three. They attempted the IV, unsuccessful, but you could say IM or IN was certainly possible there. Screaming and crying, but when not agitated, would become lethargic again. He was pretty well stoned. So he was seen, remained lethargic, constant stimulation, given three doses of Narcan, Start on a Narcan drip, 20 cc bolus of normal saline. Transported to Randall to the PICU for supportive care. He was stable on a Narcan drip, uh, but he had the Narcan drip almost all day long. It is not truly a narcotic, but it's a congener, and so it actually goes for the same receptor sites. We use Clonidine, we've used clonidine often to, uh, it's, it's an antihypertensive drug, but it's used to, uh, it's, it, it works in narcotic withdraw in withdrawal syndromes, especially if they're hypertensive, because it brings down, you know, it, but you're basically substituting a narcotic congener, 
fits in the same place, but it doesn't cause the severe, it doesn't cause happiness. <laughs> it just, you know, I don't know why someone's taking clonidine uh, for fun. You got any idea? She, she, she got him from her friends. She got him from her sister, whose son had died like two weeks before. So they were all traveling. The son that had died in the ten days of gestational birth. So the two sisters had like split the prescription of it essentially. For what? Her. For what reason? I would assume it's like depression or some type of emotional imbalance from the death of the other. It's just died. it's just used for hypertension. I mean, it doesn't. It doesn't cause it doesn't cause a good happiness at all, huh? You can't fix stupid. No, no, you can't fix stupid. It's a, it's the way it works. Well, this is a very this is a very fascinating because I mean you had the you had the right inclination to think about the Narcan. Well, we didn't look at the clonidine or clonidine, so we didn't have the pill bottle. Yeah. So we got the hospital and we got the pictures. We went down the milligrams that were. Yeah. So that's okay. Well, yeah, but not, but, but, you know, how, what's the downside of, what's the, uh, here's the thing, what's the downside of, of Narcan? Yeah, there's no, there's no downside of Narcan. And if you're, and if you're right, it's wonderful. If you're, if, if you're wrong, it doesn't make any difference usually. So, you know, I'm, I, I'm just disappointed that poison control didn't suggest that you do that. Which poison control did you call? Yeah, well, we can, we can, we'll, we'll let them know that. So here's clonidin. It's an antihypertensive, treats withdrawal symptoms. Some people have used it for ADHD. I have, I have my own biases about the whole thing about ADHD, but, and it's, they use it for certain types of pain. I mean, maybe it's the pain of, you know, having children. Um, but it's hypotensive, causes somnolence, and you treat it with fluid and Narcan. Okay, number two. Upon arrival, patient's friend states the patient was standing talking when he vomited and then fell. He says he took Coumadin. When asked questions, patient would either not answer or just state he wanted to be left alone. Deny any chest pain, would not answer any other questions. However, it was happy to be transported, well, accepted, transport to PH Southwest. He was an 81-year-old male lying on the floor initially. Alert, not responsive, normal respiration, pale, cool, diaphoretic. IV is attempted, patient placed on defib patches, IV placed, fluids given, placed on oxygen, became unresponsive, got synchronized cardioversion. Patient became alert, vitals were obtained, monitored during transport. Was given Zofran for vomiting, second IV placed, remained alert and stable during transport. So here's his thing, he's cardioverted for VTAC, 100 joules, went to sinus TAC with a pulse. Blood pressure is 140 over 102, pulse 120. 12 lead showed atrial tack, left bundle branch block. There's some of his stuff. There's a 12 lead. Left bundle branch block. So, blood pressure stayed reasonably stable, was treated preemptively for possible MI, but couldn't prove it. Now, I reviewed this case. <laughs> patient has, not even probably, patient had not been taking his medications appropriately, which included flecainide. So he has a long QT, which gives him that left bundle branch pattern. Flecainide is sort of like amiodarone. Amiodarone. It works on phase three repolarization so that it's pro it produces 
VTAC, among other things, torsades, VTAC, whatever you want, long QT syndrome. Now, in the hospital, he was in and out of AFib, sometimes with RVR. Due to VTAC, they took him to the cath lab, had no structural lesions whatsoever, so they took him back to the OR and put an AICD in him. So he is out there now with his AICD, and he'll probably continue to not take his fleck and eye correctly, but maybe that'll preempt him. So, good case, work on the, you know, you got the guy on the monitor, and he goes and goes into a run of VTAC in front of you, you can spark him right on the spot. <coughs> Case three, facility staff said they were changing the patient, 51-year-old, when she suddenly stated she couldn't breathe and became unresponsive. Well, you've immediately had some red flags when I looked at this one because I said, okay, facility staff changing a 51-year-old. So this is not a normal person. However, she was normal before that. However, it says she was in the hospital a couple of weeks ago for pneumonia. Staff started CPR prior to EMS arrival. Patient is, is a full code. Her past history is paraplegia, secondary to a um, epidural, a spinal epidural infection, abscess. IDDM, she has a trach in. And she's uh, markedly obese. Matter of fact, I think her BMI was 52. Pulseless, apneic, undead, staff performing CPR, BVM connected directly to the patient's trachea. Didn't have to worry about intubation. Full ACLS, pulse returned after two rounds of CPR, two shocks, and one epi. Move to the gurney, place the ambulance, 12 lead, negative for STEMI. On arrival at the hospital, she lost pulses just as they were transferring in. So they started CPR again in the hospital. She'd already had a dose of epinephrine. Her CO2 was 98. And this is, remember, she's already traked. She had one, two shocks for VTAC. Blood pressure initially was 140, and then they lost it when they got to the ED. Blood glucose was 209. This is her original things. This is post shocks. Now, so a really good response by the crew. Um, Patient has a six-year history of quadriplegia due to the epidural abscess. She had ROSC again in the ED, was neurologically intact. I woke up, talked, seemed to be oriented. Her condition deteriorated over the next three days with waxing and waning mentation. She had to have pressure support for her blood pressure increase ventil she increased they had to increase the rate and and volume and pressure of the ventilator to keep her airway open she had bilateral pneumonia with MRSA methicillin resistant staph aureus and pseudomonas and developed sep and sepsis from that. She had acute kidney failure secondary to the sepsis and, and her hypotension, her inability to maintain kidney function. Went to hyperkalemia. She went back to PEA. She was treated for hypokalemia. She had two or three episodes of ROSC in treatment, and she ultimately was not able to be gotten out of acute renal failure, sepsis-induced 
cardiac arrest with PEA. Mark and I have been having a, a continued conversation. We have, we have a whole bunch of patients this year that we've done really good pre-hospital care. We've got ROSC. We get them, they, and they never get out of the hospital because they have so many other comorbid factors, and they've been in, you know, we're getting ROSC after, you know, after five rounds, six rounds of epinephrine, and all of a sudden they come back with ROSC, and, you know, unfortunately they, they, they never, you know, they have so much uh, cerebral edema, ischemia that they don't seem to survive. And they almost all have incredible, you know, everything from diabetes to chronic uh, lung disease to chronic kidney disease to chronic everything disease, and they're morbidly obese too. But good luck, but great work for you guys, you know. Okay, code three for chest pain. 84-year-old walking out of bathroom in no apparent distress. Complains, I feel lousy. Patient and her daughter say patient had ongoing nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea since getting out of the hospital following a valve replacement two weeks ago. Say she hasn't been able to keep her medication down. Complains of cramping in her stomach. EKG shows AFib with a wide QRS complex and tall peaked T waves. 12 lead does not meet Scarbosa criteria. Good. <laughs> it's unknown whether patient's uh, left bundle branch block is new or an artifact of a recent valve replacement. Good choice. Further complaints of pain all over in legs, arms, and back. Complaints of weakness. Hyperkalemia is suspected based on rhythm. Becomes unable to get comfortable being transported. Begins to complain of difficulty breathing. Denies headache, blurred vision, and dizziness. So, um, blood pressure was 120 uh, palpable. Um, got some in on Dancitron. Uh, EKG showed peak T wave, suspicious. This is her, this is just a 12 lead, uh, I mean a three lead. And then uh, she got calcium, she got sodium bicarbonate, she got albuterol. Uh, there was her 12 lead. And of course she has left bundle branch block. Um, and with left bundle branch block, she has, well, she has really peaked T waves in a couple leads. Um, not so much in the others. And with that left bundle branch block, and she's got some suspicion of almost being LVH. So I'm, I don't know that I personally would have been uh, jumped on this and treated it for hyperkalemia. But I'm, I'm not going to fault it uh, because it did turn out to be hyperkalemia. But the, the, easy, the, easy, the easy thing for me to do would have been to get a, get a stat, stat potassium. You can't do that. So I understand the difference. Uh, with her history, which is nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea for several days, I would have expected that she would have been hypokalemic rather than hyperkalemic, except for one interesting thing in her history, which is not really established well here. Um, I don't, I, we didn't, oh, patient says she hasn't been able to keep her medication down when she takes them, complains of cramping in her stomach, but the medicine that she was trying to keep down was liquid potassium, which tastes terrible, makes you throw up, uh, so that, and makes your stomach cramp. So, uh, and she was, so she was getting dehydrated, but she was still taking down more potassium than she's putting out. Some of that was staying down. So that is the trick. So bottom line is, I would have waited for labs, but you can't do it. But certainly no harm is done. And it turned out to be absolutely correct. 
She was hyperkalemic. By the time she got to the ED, her potassium was 7.7. .7. It's probably just due to dehydration and di from vomiting, diarrhea, and then taking the supplemental potassium. So what they did was normalize her fluids, um, withheld her potassium for a few days. She didn't have to have dialysis. And they sent her out with, well, she decided actually her, she and her, and her daughter decided that she really wanted to be on hospice at that point because she didn't like any of this stuff. Which seems like a kind of a tragedy after having undergone a valve replacement just two weeks before, but that's the way it works. So hyperkalemia, we've already talked about treatment, so. This is the classic, now this one, I would not have any argument with treating. I mean, look at that. This is one of our cases. Uh, look at that, look at the peak T waves in this baby. So, case five, man, oh, this is a fascinating one. Now we're getting down. Patient sitting on his couch in a small camper with fire finishing up IV access. Patient is unconscious, responsive, to deep sternal rub only per fire, per neighbor. Patient said he didn't feel well last night but didn't mention that he had rectal bleeding. Neighbor states he walked in this morning and found patient minimally responsive with blood on thighs and legs and copious amounts of blood in toilet and bathroom floor. So I think our first hint is possibly we have a, we have a GI bleeding issue here. Patient's underwear soaked with blood and fecal material. Unable to obtain medication list, medical history due to all meds being in the bathroom, which is unaccessible due to blood. And desire of persons to go into that bathroom. <laughs> Patient stated, taken to stretcher via tarp, a stretcher would not fit in the trailer. Patient then began agonal respirations, was found to be in cardiac arrest. CPR initiated. Upon getting pulses back, patient was given Narcan for AMS protocol. Glucose is apparently normal. Shortly afterward, patient exhibited tonic-clonic seizure activity. Despite Versed administration, patient was apneic but still had a gag and so was successfully RSI'd. So we have a GI bleeder who's gone into a cardiac arrest who said ROSC isn't waking up has a gag reflex, gets RSI, intubated, and transported. Multiple secondary IV attempts, unsuccessful, remained with pulses and blood pressure for rem a remainder of transport, turned over with continually declining blood pressure. All, okay, so oxygen, pulse, pulses, electrical activity, blood pressure, 82, well, it can't really be pulses, electrical activity then if it's got blood pressure of 82 or 50. Got some epinephrine, sinus arrhythmia, um, on and on and on. So, ET tube, okay. This is a very remarkable case. This guy was a chronic alcoholic, remember, one of the major causes of GI bleeding. Had two bleeding duodenal ulcers probably aggravated by him taking non-steroidal anti-inflammatories for his abdominal pain. He responded to, he got five units of blood and a lot of fluids, was in the ICU for two days, was extubated, and was totally neurologically normal. So, his cardiac arrest was secondary to hypovolemia, hypovolemic shock. He had an echo, which was 100% normal after resuscitation. Discharged home on day five. Now, the only, the, my only, my only issue on this guy was with a, a guy with a map of less than 65. He was grossly hypotensive. I probably would have used K2 
ketamine to intubate him rather than atomidate, but who can argue? Yeah, turn up his fluid, yeah. But the problem is you couldn't get that second IV in. This is, a, I mean, it's a remarkable case. And, and it, even more remarkable is that this guy, this, this person lives and lived well. I mean, he, he, he came home totally normal so he can continue to drink. Okay. So there is justice. <laughs> All right. Next month, I believe, is cases. Next month isn't a lecture series. Is it? Details to follow. Okay, details to follow. All right. Any questions before you go? I know, I mean, about, about this sort of thing, general medical questions, not life philosophy, things like that. Okay. All right. <laughs>